Hey guys, my name is Devin Sherry. I'm an aspiring level designer and today I am going to show you how to create an automated turret that will fire at the player as well as track the player's position all using Kismet in the Unreal Development Kit. So let me jump in real quick and play it real fast just to show you what it does. As you can see from that video demonstration I just showed you, uh, the turret uh, starts out in a position where it doesn't look like it's on, and once you get within its radius, it'll animate and start firing at you. And if you leave its radius, it'll play that animation backwards, so it'll and it'll stop firing at you. And also, if you start shooting the turret, it'll start showing signs of breaking, and then eventually it'll be destroyed and stop firing at the player. So that's the kind of behavior I was going for. Let me show you in Kismet what the whole script looks like and then we'll start from scratch and uh, redo the script step by step. So the first thing I did, I set up a bunch of variables. I set up a total of four vector variables. One for the player's location, one for the turret's gun location, one for the turret gun's rotation, and then one for the player's rotation. Uh, next I did nine float variables. Uh, I'll go over more of these in detail because there are a lot of them. but uh, all these floats have a purpose. And lastly, we do two object variables. One is the interactor that uh, represents our turret. Uh, one's an empty uh, object variable for the rocket projectiles that we fire. And then the two booleans, uh, one is for knowing if the turret is alive or not. And the other one is for knowing if the turret is ready to fire or not. So from there, uh, the first thing we do is uh, the level loaded event is our initial event. This is just for the demonstration, but your initial event could be a t trigger being used or a trigger being touched or an enemy dying or after a cutscene. Any of those will work fine, but for the sake of uh, demonstration, the initial event is level loaded. And then from there, we get the distance between the player and the turret. And then from there, we determine whether or not the player is within the turret's uh, range. And if the player is, It'll animate to play and start firing at the player and start tracking their location. So that's what this does over here. This tracks the location of the player and rotates the turret accordingly. And then for that, this is where we spawn projectiles and start firing at the player. And then last, down here, this is our setup for knowing when we need to destroy the turret, if the player has been shooting at it enough. So we have the turret take damage and we add that damage it takes to its current damage and then we compare that to when we want the turret to start breaking and then when we want the turret to start uh, to be destroyed and that's what happens here so that's the whole script it shouldn't be too long to do from scratch a lot of it was just a lot of troubleshooting for myself so let's jump in uh, with a new level and we'll start this from scratch so let's go over here to create new level let's choose midday lighting so we're given this kind of scene here. Now the first thing I want to do, I kind of want to duplicate this large cube in the center. And to do that, hold Alt and just drag it on any axis to create a copy. And I'm just going to do that and place it over here. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because the turret will stop firing if there's an obstruction between the player and the turret. And that's just to have one close by so we can hide behind and see if the turret stops firing or not. So let me position the player behind there. So now the first thing I want to do from this step is I want to go to View, World Properties, and then down under by Game Type, I want to change the default game type and the game type for PIE to, uh, from None to UT Game. I want to do that for both parameters. And the reason why I do that is because Kismet won't work properly unless you're using some derivative of the UT game type. So if you have none, uh, Kismet won't work no matter what. So make sure you do that. Our next step is we're going to uh, get the meshes that we're going to use to simulate our turret. So let's go into the content browser up here. And then make sure you have UDK game highlighted under your packages. And then the search bar, let's type in S underscore VH underscore cicada underscore dmg underscore zero one f 
So this is what will act as the turret's barrel where the rockets will uh, spawn from. So let's position that in the location that we like. And I'm going to make it face upwards like this because this is its uh, unfiring position. So basically when we animate it, it will go up and then rotate and then move forward. That will be its animation. But for now, we're going to leave it at this kind of position. And then we need one more uh, mesh. And it's basically the same name, except we're going to change the 01F to 02F. This will act as the turret's base. Oh, so let's position that in the way we like. Yes, position as close as possible to this. And now set that up properly. So now what we want to do is we want to convert both of these static meshes into movers. So select both of them by holding control and clicking on both of them. Then right click go down to convert and then convert static mesh actor to mover so now both of these are uh, interb actors so let's hit F4 real quick just to confirm that they are both interb actors so it says interb actor properties and then two selected so they are both interb actors so that's good and now what we want to do is we want to give uh, each piece its own unique kind of collision uh, we're going to do that for a big purpose uh, I'll explain it in a second so let's first select the turret's base Hit F4 to bring up its properties. And then let's type in collision in the search bar on the top. And then under collision type, instead of collide underscore no collision, let's change that to collide underscore block all. Because we want to make sure that the player can collide with this, and we also want to make sure it can collide with projectile shot from the player so we can actually do any damage. So that's set up. Now for the turret, we're going to do a different one. So let's hit the select it and hit F4. And then under collision type, we're going to do collide underscore touch weapons. And the reason why we're going to do that is because we're going to be spawning projectiles from within this turret. So if this actually had block all collision, the projectiles will explode within the mesh itself. It wouldn't be able to pass through and go to the player. So that's why we do that. Now that that's set up, we can go into Kismet and start setting up all the variables that we have to use for this script. So let's, pre let's go to Kismet. And now there's going to be a total of 17 different variables, and that seems like a lot, but the reason why we're going to do so many variables is just so our script can be easily read by people who haven't, like, people who are looking at it from the outside in, people who may not understand Kismet fully, they'll be able to look at these variables and kind of understand what their values are and how they relate to the script itself. So, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to set up the first four vector variables that I explained at the beginning of the video. Each of these will have a, a specific purpose. So let's go create a vector variable by going right clicking an empty space of the Kismet window, going to new variable, down to vector. Now a vector variable holds three different kinds of parameters, x, y, and z, and that will be useful for knowing where the player's location is in 3D space and the player's rotation in 3D space, as well as the 3D space of location for the turret gun and the turret gun's rotation in 3D space. So the first one we're going to leave at default 0, 0, 0 for x, y, and z. And we're just going to change the var name from none to player location. And obviously this variable will track the player's location uh, constantly so that we know when it's within the range of the turret. Now, the next one we're going to do, we're just going to press control C, control V with the vector variable we create selected just to create a copy. Now for this one, uh, we're going to call this player rotation. So under var name, change it from player location to player rotation. And we're also leave its values at 0, 0, and 0. So control C, control V, new version. And now for the third vector variable, we're going to change this var name to turret gun rotation. Now the very last thing we're going to do we're going to control C, control V, one last duplicate for a fourth vector variable. And we're going to name this turret gun location. 
And now for the X, Y, and Z, we're going to need special numbers. And oh, we're going to find that out by, pre by clicking our turret in our scene, pressing F4, uh, going back to the normal properties. And we're going to look for a property called movement. And under movement, we see its rotation and its location. Now, what we want to do, we basically want to copy the X, Y, and Z coordinates of its location into the X, Y, and Z parameters of our turret gun location vector variable. So for X, I have 274. For Y, I have negative 500. And for Z, I have 102. These numbers might be slightly different for, from yours, uh, depending on how, where, how you set your things up. But just make sure you copy those numbers exactly how they show up in your, in your scene. So that's all four uh, vector variables. So what I want to do now, I want to put them into a comment box, just so it's more uh, organized. So hold Control, Alt, and then left click, drag a marquee selection, just to select all our variables. And then press C on the keyboard to bring up a comment box. And I'm going to name this comment Vector Variables. And as you see, it creates a comment box and it makes it more uh, neatly confined to a space so that we know exactly where our variables are. So our next step is we're going to be creating a total of nine float variables, and I'll go over what each one does as we create them. So let's first create a float variable. So right click, go to new variable, float, and then float. Now we're gonna leave this float value at the default at zero, and we're just gonna change this variable name to rotational difference. And what rotational difference will do is uh, it will set up a, a particular uh, rotational difference that's needed because with the turret mesh, uh, initially it did, uh, the barrel of the turret mesh does not track the player head on. It was more, it had a kind of a, like a lag of rotational difference that it couldn't make up. So it wasn't really looking at the player. So we use this number to kind of add that difference. So control C, control V, a new float. So I'm going to control C, control V, copy of rotational difference again. Because the next one's value is going to be zero, so we want to leave it at default zero for its float value. And then for the variable name, we're going to change it to final rotation. And this variable will just hold the final rotation that we're going to actually set to the turret so that it'll constantly refresh and keep pointing at the player no matter what. So let's control C, control V, a new float. Uh, the fourth float variable is going to have a value of 1000 and a variable name of minimum turret proximity and this what this means is uh, th a thousand is the minimum distance the player has to be within before the turret animates uh, this is just something I thought I liked seem natural as a distance but you can change that to wherever you see fit if you want it to be a longer ranged weapon or a shorter ranged weapon that's where you change yes yeah, flat flow value is what you would change so I'm going to control C control V a fifth float variable its float value is going to be at zero it's going to stay there and the under variable name we're going to change it to turret damage taken and this flow variable will hold the amount of damage taken to the turret when it's shot by the player. So that's going to be useful. So let's control C, control V, a sixth float. Its default value is going to stay at zero. And its variable name is going to be turret current damage. And this float variable will just hold the amount of damage the turret has already taken. And as we shoot the turret, We'll add the damage it's been it's taking from the player and add it to its current damage, and then the newest current damage will be a higher number. So let's control C, control V. A seventh float variable. Its default value is going to be at zero, and we're going to name this variable name player distance. And this will be the float variable that holds the distance between the player and the turret. Uh, that will be useful to know when the player is within that 1,000 uh, minimum turret proximity float we made. And we'll do a couple, a couple of float comparisons for that. Now for the last two float variables, they're going to be involved with the uh, turret actually taking damage. So this is going to be our, uh, this one we're going to create. The float value is going to be at 120. And now act as the turret's total health. 
If you want the turret to be weaker or stronger, this is the float value you'll change. And under the variable name, let's change it to turret health amount. And let's control C, control V, the ninth and final float. And let's change this value to 50. And let's change its variable name to turret breaking amount. Now this flow will represent the amount of damage taken to the turret that we want it to show signs that it's starting to break. So if you, wa if you watch the beginning again, you'll see that there's sparks shooting out. After a few shots, that's what that breaking amount does. Once it hits that amount, it'll start playing that uh, particle emitter. And then once it breaks, it'll shut that particle emitter off and just play an explosion particle. And we'll add those particles later on when we need to do that section of the tutorial. So I, what I want to do now, that we have all our flow variables created, I want to do Control and Alt, hold that down, do a marquee selection and create another comment box by pressing C on the keyboard. And let's call this float variables. Now I'm just going to select all these, move them down a little bit. Now last but not least, we're going to create the Boolean and object variables we'll need. So let's start with the Boolean variables. So a boolean is either a true or false variable, and we'll need to use that to check if the turret is alive, meaning it hasn't been destroyed yet, and we're going to need another one to check if the turret is ready to fire, meaning that its animation has played and it's ready to fire. So let's right click, go to new variable, and bool. So the first one we're going to do, we're going to leave its default value at false, and we're just going to change its variable name uh, to turret fire ready. And the reason why we're going to start this off at false is because Initially, it's not going to be ready to fire until the player is within that 1,000 um, distance of the turret. Once it reaches that 1,000 uh, units of the turret, it will we'll change the turret fire rate to the true, and once it's true, it will start tracking the player and firing at the player. So let's Control-C, Control-V this bool, and we're going to change this one's B value to 1, making it true, and we're going to change the variable name to turret is alive. The reason we're going to do this is because the turret is going to be alive at level start. We haven't destroyed it yet, so we want to keep that at true. And now we're going to create two different object variables. One will represent the barrel of the turret, so the mesh that I have selected here. This will represent our turret barrel, so I want to make a, an object variable for that. So let's right click with the mesh or with the interbactor selected and go down to new object var using interbactor 0 and now I'm going to change its var name to turret so we know what it is and now the last object variable is going to be an empty object variable that will re represent the rocket projectiles also right click go to new variable object object and when we do that it automatically creates a blank variable which is what we want so let's change its let's just change its variable name to rocket projectile. Now let's create a comment box around these guys. Press C on the keyboard to get a comment up. And we're going to call this boolean and object variables. So let me move this in a nice position. Okay, so that's all our variables that we need, all 17. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start scripting. So let me open up Kismet all the way up just to give us a lot of space. Now the first thing we want to do, our initial event is going to be once the level is loaded. So let's go to the new event, level loaded. So let's place this a little bit away from our variables. So once the level's loaded, the first thing we want to do is we want to get the distance between the player and the turret. And then based on that position, on based on whether or not the player is in within the uh, proximity of the turret, we want to either play the animation forward that we're going to create, or we want to uh, play that uh, animation in reverse. So let's go right click, go to new action, actor, get distance. And what get, get distance does is it takes two different objects uh, into variable connectors, and then it, ta it gets that distance between the two, and then outputs the distance into this uh, variable connector here. So for the A, we want to put the player. So holding down the P key, left click on the A variable connector, the pink box, left click on it, 
and it'll create an all players variable. So in its properties, just change, just uncheck all players, just to make it player zero, which is us. So now for B, we want to do the object variable that represents our turret. So instead of using the variable we created over here, we're going to use a named variable that we'll use, that we'll use to reference that variable, just to keep our variables nice and like locked over in this position. So what I want to do, I want to right click, go to new variable, and go down to named variable. And named variables allow you to you reference any type of variable that you've already created. So we want it to represent our object variable, the object variable that represents our turret. So under expected type and its properties, we want to go to object because our turret enter vector is an object variable. And then for find bar name, let's just we have to put in turret because that's what we named our variable. And you'll know you did everything right once you get a check mark on your variable. So let's connect that to B. And now for distance, we want to put we want to plug this into a float variable that we've already created, which is player distance. So let's create another named variable. And then in its properties for ex expected type, uh, let's change it to float because the player distance is a float variable. And then for find bar name, let's type in player distance. And we got the check mark, so we know that's good. So let's plug that in. Now what we want to do is I'm going to plug in loaded invisible, the, this output from the law of loaded event, and plug it into the input of the get distance. Now from here, uh, we want the we want the script to be constantly getting the uh, distance of the player and the turret. Because if we didn't have this as a loop, the, once the level's loaded, it will give you the distance, but it will stop giving you the distance after the first time. So we want to create a loop that will check the player's distance from the turret every 0 0.01 seconds. We're going to need a delay node. So holding down D on the keyboard, left click to create a delay node. And down on its properties, under duration, change it from 1 to 0 0.01. So every hundredth of a second, it's going to be checking the distance between the player and the turret and outputting it to player distance. So the out output of get distance, plug that into start, and then the finished of the delay node, plug that into the in of the get distance. So now what happens is once the level's loaded, it'll get the distance. Once it gets the distance the first time, it'll delay for 0 0.01 seconds and then go back and get the distance again. And then it'll delay for another 0 0.01 seconds and get the distance again. So that'll be every 0 0.01 seconds we're getting the distance between the player and the turret, which is what we want. We want it to constantly be checking. So now it's at the point where we need to make a float comparison between the player's distance and the minimum turret proximity float that we made to check if the player's within that range. And if they are, we're going to play our animation forward. And if they're not, we're going to play that animation in reverse. So let's right click, go to new condition, comparison, compare float. And the compare float takes two float variables and it will compare them. And based on their comparison, we have outputs to do certain things. So let's plug the out output of the get distance into the in input of the compare float. And for A, I'm going to plug this into the player distance node here. Now for B, we're going to need a new name variable that will represent the minimum turret proximity. So I'm just going to copy and paste the player distance name variable. And I'm just going to change its find var name from player distance to minimum turret proximity. And we got the check mark still, so it's set up properly. So I'm going to plug the B into there. Now, uh, before we go in uh, into playing our matinee animation, we want to set a few things first. And we want to compare a few things. So the first thing, uh, the thing we're going to compare is we're going to check if the turret is alive or not. So let's go find a compare bool node by right clicking, going to new condition, comparison, compare bool. Now I'm going to put this down here. And basically what we want to happen here is if A is less than B, meaning that the player is within the turret minimum proximity, we want to compare uh, the bool turret is alive. So let's create a new named variable for that. Let's change its expected type to bool. And then for find var name, type in turret is alive. And then plug that into the bool. Uh, output 
I mean the bool variable connector of the compare bool node. And basically what's happening here so far is once the player's within the distance of the minimum turret proximity, we're going to check if the turret is alive. And then if the turret is alive, we want to set up a gate. So let me get a gate real quick and I'll explain what it does. So we'll go to new action, misc, gate. And what a gate does is it needs two different actions to fire or events to fire in order to uh, have its output actually go into the next action or event. So first before we do anything we're going to uncheck the open parameter in its uh, properties because we want it to be closed initially. So now what we're going to do is we're going to plug in the true uh, output of the compare bool into the open of the gate and then we're going to plug in the A is less than then B into the in of the gate. And so what's happening here is that once the player is within the proximity of the turret, we're going to compare the bool to see if the turret is alive. So if the turret is alive, that means the gate's going to open. And once the player is within range, the in is going to be true. So once the player is within proximity and the turret is alive is true, the gate's going to open and allow whatever we want to pass through it. So what, what we're going to do before we pass anything through this gate is uh, we're, going to we're going to copy and paste both the compare bool, the turret is alive boolean name variable, and the gate. Uh, copy and paste them and put them up top here. And what we're going to do here is we're going to do the same kind of setup but for when A is greater than B, meaning the player is not within the appropriate distance of the minimum turret proximity. So do A is greater than B into the in of the comparable as well as into the in of the second gate we created. So now that we have that set up, we can start uh, putting things into a matinee. So let's go right click and then new matinee. And before we actually start animating, I want to plug everything into the appropriate input of the matinee. So the out output of the uh, gate that's related to the A is greater than B uh, compare float output, we're going to plug that into the reverse. So let me move this a little bit. And the reason why we're going to do that is because once A is greater than B, meaning the player is out of reach of the turret, we want the turret to reverse its animation and go back to its idle position. And then I'm going to plug the false uh, output of the compare bool that's related to the A is greater than B comparison float, plug them to stop. So once the turret is alive, boolean is false, we want to stop the animation completely. We don't want to have it animated anymore. I'm also going to do that same thing, the false into the stop of the other compare bool that we have that's related to the A is less than B compare, uh, float comparison. So plug that into stop. And now the gate output of the A is less than B uh, comparison float output, we're going to plug that into play. So basically when the player is within proximity, we want the animation to play and if they're out and then if they're outside the uh, proximity of the turret, we want the animation to go in reverse. And then once the turret is a live bool is false, meaning that the player has destroyed the turret, uh, we want the animation to stop completely and not play again. So now that's set up, we have to animate our turret. So having the turret selected into our scene, let's double click on the matinee to open up our matinee uh, animation tool. Now I'm going to zoom in onto our timeline by using the scroll wheel while in this timeline section. And I'm going to set up the total length of our animation, which is going to be 0.8 seconds. So I'm going to grab this green arrow and just drag it to 0 0.80 seconds. And I'm also going to just, I'm going to zoom out again and do the same with the red arrow uh, at five seconds. So I'm just going to drag that, zoom back in, and put it at 0.8 seconds. So this basically sets up the timeline duration of our animation. Now making sure the turret is selected in our scene, right click in this gray area and go down to new, add new empty group. Name this, er uh, this group turret animation. Press enter. And now we're going to right click on the turret animation right click on it, add new movement track. 
So now with the movement track, it automatically gives you the first keyframe. So that's good. So now we're going to set up a total of uh, three more uh, keyframes, one at 0.2 seconds, one at 0.5 seconds, and the last one at 0.8 seconds. So let's start animating our turret. So the first keyframe is going to be at 0 0.20 seconds. So press enter to create a new keyframe. And we want to move uh, the turret upwards 32 units. So drag it up on the z-axis. Make sure it's animating by moving the slider just to see if it goes up and down. The next uh, keyframe is going to be at 0.5 seconds. And we're going to rotate it 90 degrees on the x-axis this way. So let's see if that animates appropriately. And we can see it's animating appropriately. Now at 0.8 seconds is our final keyframe, so press enter. Now let's just move this forward 32 units. So let's play our animation just to see if it looks good. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Now the next thing we're going to do here, we're going to add sound effects just to add a good depth of polish to the animation itself. So what I want to do, I want to just minimize all my windows and go into the content browser, remove anything that's in the search bar. And what I want to look for, I'm going to look for a sound cue that will play when the turret plays uh, forward and I'm going to have another different sound cue play when the animation is played in reverse. So let's find our first uh, sound cue. So let's type in A underscore door underscore metal zero three underscore open start Q. And we were to select this in the content browser and then go back into our matinee animation. Uh, right click on the turret animation and then do add new soundtrack. And then at uh, with the soundtrack selected, let's get our slider here at point at zero zero seconds. I'm gonna press enter, and then that means it's gonna it's gonna play whatever sound cue we have currently selected in our content browser. So let's press play to hear it. So we have it set up so it looks like it's setting up and gives the noise appropriately. I'll play it one more time. And now what I want to do, I want to create another soundtrack. But before I do that, I'm gonna find the other sound cue that we need. So let's go back into our content browser. And now this one uh, is basically the same name, just change open to close. So let's select that new sound cue in the content browser, go back into our matinee, create another soundtrack by right clicking on the turret animation and going down to add new soundtrack. And then we're gonna put this at 0.8 seconds. I'm gonna press enter and you'll see that it's going to play at 0.8 seconds and go on to a point where we're not even animating anymore. But what I want to do now is down here in its properties, hit play on reverse, and it'll just flip it around. So that when it's when it plays in reverse, uh, the animation, the sound cue will play. So let's hit play to hear it. Uh, hear, the, the, hear the first animation uh, sound play. And then play in reverse, we hear a different one. So now that that's set up, uh, we can look at our Kismet script so far, and we can actually jump in and play and see our Kismet script working so far. So let's uh, go into play. And as we can see, it is animating right, and if we leave, so it's working. So that's good. So now our next step is going to be what we want to do after the matinee animation plays. So actually the very first thing we want to do is when the animation is completed, we want to set the turret fire ready uh, bool to true. Because once the animation is complete, that means the turret's ready to fire. So we got to set a bool to a certain value, so we'll need a set variable node. So let's right click, go to new action, go down to set variable, and we want to set a bool variable. Now for its value, I want to right click on the variable connector and hit create new bool variable and just change its b value from 0 to 1 so that it's true because we want to set the fire ready 
uh, turret fire ready variable to true. So let's create a new name variable. For expected type, let's make it bool. And for find bar name, we're going to do turret fire ready. So we got the check marks, it means it's good. So let me just drag this a good way away. And let's plug in the completed output of the matinee into the in input of the set variable node. And now I want to copy and paste the set variable node. Place it down underneath a little bit. And now I want to plug in the reversed output of the matinee into this new uh, set boolean. But I want to change the value from true to false on the second one. So that when the uh, animation plays in reverse, once that's done, we want to set this variable back to false so that the turret isn't ready to fire anymore. Because that means once the animation is reversed, it's going to be in its idle position and it's not going to be firing at the player. So now that's set up, we could start doing the logic behind the uh, turret tracing the player and uh, following the, the having the turret uh, rotate and follow the player. So the very first thing we're going to need, we're going to need a trace node. So let's go to new action, misc, go down to trace. What a trace does is it sends out a trace to see if the turret and the player can see one another. And if the trace uh, hits the right object, uh, it will not be obstructed. Or if it doesn't hit the right object, it will become obstructed. So the first thing I want to do for the start I want to get copy and paste a copy of my turret name variable. So let's copy and paste that. Bring it over. And I'm going to plug it into the start. Now for the end is going to, it's going to be the player. So holding down the P key, left click on the end variable connector, and then uncheck all players in the properties just to make it player zero. And then plug the completed output of the matinee into the end of the trace. So uh, when the trace is not obstructed, meaning that the turret and the player can see one another, we want to get the location and the rotation of the player. So we need a get location and rotation node. So let's right click, go to new action, actor, get location and rotation. Now for the target, I'm going to create a copy of our player zero object variable, plug that into target. And now we're going to need to create two name variables for two different kinds of vector variables that we had created in the beginning. So let's right click, go to new variable, named variable, and then expected type, go down to vector, and then for find var name, we'll do player location. Plug that into the location uh, variable connector of the get location and rotation. Now copy and paste the player location and change its uh, find var name to player rotation and plug that into the rotation out, uh, variable connector of the get location and rotation node. And now plug the not obstructed uh, output of the trace into the in of the get location. So basically, uh, once uh, the trace between the player and the turret is not obstructed, we want to get the location and rotation of the player and then set the rotation of the turret based upon where the player is. So now what we need to do, we need to get a certain uh, vector component of the player rotation. We want to get the correct rotation uh, so when the player is facing the turret, the turret is facing the player. So we need to get a vector, uh, get vector component node, go to new action, math, get vector components. Now let's plug the out output of the get location and rotation node into the new input of the get vector components. <clears throat> now for the input vector, we want to get, we want to plug in the player rotation. And now, uh, the axis that we want is the y-axis, and that's the axis that we use to look around uh, left and right, which is the one we need. So what I'm going to need to do is we're going to create a new uh, name variable, make it a float for its expected type, and then for find var name, we're going to do rotational difference. And then plug the y variable connector to that. So basically the y, uh, the current y rotation of the player is going to be our rotational difference. And now what we need to do is we're going to add the additional rotation to that rotational difference and then that result will be the final rotation for the turret gun. 
So first, let's get an add float node. So right click, new action, math, add float. Now let's plug this, uh, plug the output of the vector components into the input of the add float. Now for A, we're going to do rotational difference. So let's just plug it into this one. Now let's copy and paste this rotational difference uh, name variable. And let's just change the var name uh, to additional rotation. And let's plug that into B. So what we're happening here is we're going to get the player's current rotation, add that 1700 to that float because of the whole rotational difference I was talking about earlier where it wasn't facing the player the way I wanted it to. And now for the float result, let's copy and paste a new name variable and then change its var name to final rotation and then go to float result. So now the final so now the final rotation is the sum of the rotational difference uh, and the additional rotational floats. Now that we have the final rotation, we want to set that as the y uh, vector component of the turret gun rotation variable. So let's write new action math set vector components. Now for our output vector, let's copy and paste player rotation and then change its name from player rotation to turret gun rotation. And then plug that into the output vector. Now let's also plug in the output of the add float into the end of the set vector components. Now, uh, which uh, co vector component do we want to set for the rotation? We want to set the Y to the final rotation. So just plug the final rotation into the Y variable connector. And now we just need to set the actor location and rotation. So we go to new action, actor, set actor location. So plug the set, act, set vector components output into the input of the set actor location. Now for the target, uh, I'm going to create a copy of our turret uh, named variable. Drag that back over, set it as our target. Now for location, uh, I'm going to copy and paste the turret gun rotation and uh, change its name from turret gun rotation to turret gun location and plug that into location and now I'm going to create another copy of the turret gun rotation and then plug it into the rotation of our set actor location. So now the very last thing we want to do is we want to constantly be looping this so that it'll constantly be setting and getting the rotation of the player and setting it uh, to the turret. So right click on the output of the set actor location and do set activate delay and make this 0 0.01. So w once we have that set up, uh, once we have the delay set up, we want to plug the out output of the set actor location back into the trace. So every 0 0.01 seconds it'll be tracing where the player is and if it's not obstructed it will get the location and start following the player. So let's see if that works. And then we see it's working. So that's awesome. So what we want to do is we want to compare a few bulls and based on their value we want to spawn projectiles. So let's go right click, new condition, comparison, compare bool. And we're going to plug in the output of the set actor uh, location node into the end of the compare bool. Now the two bools we're going to compare are going to be our turret fire is ready uh, boolean. So let's create a copy of that. Plug that into bool. And we're also going to use the turret is alive node uh, variable. So copy and paste a uh, version of that. And also plug that into bool. And so it'll compare these two bools and if they're both true uh, we want to start firing uh, projectiles at uh, the player. If, uh, if if one of them is false or they're both false, we don't want to spawn any projectiles at them. So let's create a delay just for timing purposes for the projectiles. Uh, set it to 0.5 seconds. Now plug the true output of the comparable into the start of the delay. And now we're going to create a spawn projectile node. So go to new action, spawn projectile. Now I'm going to right click, go to expose variable, and then projectile class object. 
And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new uh, named variable, um, expect to type object, and then find var name. We're going to do rocket projectile. And we're going to plug that into projectile class just so we know what projectile class we're uh, using. And now select spawn projectile, and under projectile class, do uh, UT PROJ rocket. Now plug the finished output of the delay node we created into the input of the spawn projectile. And now for the spawn uh, location, we're going to use the turret gun location. So create a copy of that, plug that into spawn location. And now for the target location, we're going to use the player location. So let's go find the player location, copy and paste it, and then plug it into the player location. So now this projectile, one, they're going to spawn where the turret gun is, and they're going to be firing at the location of the player. So now we're going to create one more delay node. So hold down D on the keyboard and press uh, left click. We're going to leave this at one second. Plug the output of the spawn projectile into the uh, start input of the delay. And then I'm going to plug the finished output of the second delay node back into the end of the compare bool. So now every 1.5 seconds, a projectile will spawn as long as both uh, the turret is alive variable and the turret fire ready variables are. The last thing we need to do is we're going to set up an instigator and that's just going to be a blank uh, object variable. So let's just right click on the instigator uh, variable connector and just do create new object variable. And we're going to just do that because if it's the player as the instigator, the rockets won't uh, collide with the player and cause any damage. So we're just going to do a blank one. Let's see if that works. And it's working, which is really good. Now the last section we're going to do is we're going to set it up so the turret can receive damage and certain things happen. So in some empty space, let's select the base of the turret, this uh, interactor. Let's select that, right click into Kismet, do new event using interactor underscore one. And let's do take damage. So uh, when the, with the take damage event uh, selected in Kismet, let's change the minimum damage, damage amount in the properties to one, the damage threshold to 50, and then for max trigger count, we're just going to make that zero. So it can be triggered an infinite amount of times. So from there, uh, I'm going to create a new float name variable. So let's just go down to new variable, name variable. Expect this type, let's do float. And then for find var name, let's do turret damage taken. And let's plug that into the damage taken uh, variable connector, the take damage event. So whenever the base of the turret takes damage, the damage it takes will be placed into this flow variable. So now what we want to do is we want to add the damage it's taken to the turret's current damage. So let's do an add vote, uh, add float. So go to new action, math, add float. Let's plug in the turret damage taken uh, variable into A. Let's create a copy of the turret damage taken. Change its name to turret current damage. Plug that into B, as well as the final result. So basically what we want to have happen here is once the damage has been dealt to the uh, turret, we want to add that damage to its current damage and then make that the new uh, current damage. So if I have three damage on me and then I receive three more, my new current is going to be six. So that's what that does. So let's plug in the out output into the in input of add float. And now what we want to do is we want to compare two different things. We want to compare the turret's current damage to the turret's breaking amount. And we also want to compare the turret's current damage to the turret's health amount. So let's right click, new condition, comparison, compare float. And let's create a copy of that as well. So there's two of them. So let's create a copy of the turret current damage, plug it into A of both compare floats. And now for the top compare float, we're going to compare the turret breaking amount. So let's uh, create a copy of the current damage uh, variable. Change its variable name to turret breaking amount. And then plug that into B. 
and then create a copy of this and change the variable name to turret health amount and then plug that into B and now what we need to do is we're going to plug in the out output of the add float into both inputs of the two compare floats so now before we go any further with this we're going to need two specific particles for our turret so let's go into con the content browser and let's type in p underscore vehicle underscore damage underscore one underscore cicada so let's drag that in to our scene and let's place it within the turret mesh so that should be good right there now hit F4 with the emitter selected and we're going to uncheck auto activate because if it's auto activate it will just start playing once the level is loaded and we only want to activate it when uh, the player has done enough damage to where it starts to break so let's go back into Kismet and now with the compare float what we want to have happen is if the, cur the turret's current damage is either greater than or equal to the turret breaking amount we want to turn on that particle so we're going to need a toggle node so right click go to new action down the toggle and then toggle now making sure that the particle emitter and our scene selected right click on the target variable connector and do new object var using emitter at zero and then plug in the a is greater than or equal to b uh, output into the turn on input of the toggle node so effectively once the player has done enough damage it will turn on uh, this particle emitter now what we need is another uh, particle it's to simulate the explosion when the player actually destroys the turret itself. So let's search P underscore VH underscore death underscore special case underscore one underscore base underscore far. So let's let's drag that into our scene. Place it appropriately. And then hit F4 with that emitter selected and let's turn off auto activate on this one as well for the same reasons as we did for the other one. So now uh, let's copy and paste this toggle node and the emitter uh, variable. Control C, Control V. And now making sure you have the newest particle selected in your scene. I want you to right click on the copy of the emitter underscore zero uh, variable, right click on that and, and choose assign emitter underscore one to object variables. And now we'll place the emitter underscore zero variable with the em new emitter. So now for the second float, we want to do the same kind of thing where while once the turret's current damage is greater than or equal to the turret's health amount, we want to turn on this uh, particle as well. And we also want to turn off the other particle because this, uh, this first particle we did is a continuous particle it'll keep playing a broken like electric particle until it's told to be turned off and we only want it to turn off when uh, the player has destroyed the turret so now what we want to do is we're going to do a lot of things for the uh, second compare float for when the turret's current damage is greater than or equal to the turret health amount because that's where we want to set the turret as a live variable to false that's where we want to destroy the turret objects, uh, make them disappear. And we also want to play an explosion sound. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set the bool uh, turret is alive to false. So let's right click, go to new action, set, bool, uh, set variable, and then bool. Now for value, I want you to right click on that to create new bool variable and leave its default false because we want to make the turret is alive false once it's destroyed. Now let's find a turret is alive boolean name variable and let's just copy and paste it and bring it over and set that as our target and then plug the A is greater than or equal to B uh, output of the compare float where we compare the turret current damage and the turret health amount plug that into the end input of the bool and then the output of the set bool variable we're going to plug this in to the original compare float where we compare the player distance and the minimum turret uh, proximity and the reason why we do this is because once it's set we want it to check 
because you see how we make the comparison to see if the turret is alive or not that's why we plug it in so once the turret isn't alive anymore we want it to go back to the compare float and then check if it's alive or not now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to destroy both uh, object variables that represent our turret so go to new action actor destroy now for the target uh, I'm gonna find and I'm gonna copy and paste a, a copy of the turret object name variable we created. Plug that into target, and then I'm gonna select the turret's base in our uh, scene. With that selected, right-click on the target variable connector, and then do new object var using interbacter underscore one, and then making sure both are plugged in. And then I'm gonna plug in the a is greater than or equal to b. Uh, compare float output for the turret damage and the turret health amount. Plug that into destroy. The last thing we're going to do, we're going to play a certain sound effect, an explosion sound effect. So let's go back into our content browser, clear anything in our search bar. Let's type in a underscore character underscore robot impact underscore body explosion. underscore Q. Select that in the content browser. Now back in our Kismet window, let's go to new action, sound, play sound. And then it's properties under play sound, hit this green arrow and it'll assign the sound cue that we had selected in our content browser. So now plug the A is greater than or equal to B comparison output of the turret, turret current damage and the turret health amount into the play of the play sound, and it will play the explosion sound. Now that we have the explosion working, let's see if it's working properly. And it is, awesome. So that's everything. So let me first just build everything, build lighting and pads and everything. And let me take this time to say thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit of something. Uh, definitely comment in the comments below with any suggestions for new tutorials or if you have any questions or if I need to explain something further. I'll be more than happy to take the time to answer your questions if you need any help with anything. Also, make sure to like the video if you liked what I taught you today. Also, su subscribe to my channel if you enjoy the videos I create. Uh, in the description below, I'll have a link to my portfolio, uh, particularly the page in my portfolio where I'll have a written tutorial of this tutorial as well as well as the video demonstration and this video tutorial. Uh, also make sure to check out other stuff in my portfolio as well. I'll also be linking all the games that I've been working on. So make sure to check those out as well. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, have a good one.